first year in the ODA greenhouse with Beth Meyer Shanai. I think you already got an introduction to her from Becky. Want to say hi, Beth? Hi, everybody. I'm just getting a few more plants set up to go over and we'll get started with some ID. So how long has this greenhouse been here? Um, it's probably been here 10 or 15 years in total. Um, it was our former biological control entomologist, Eric Coombs, who kind of got it all set up. And now we have uh, Joel Price, who's our current biological control entomologist. He actually is managing most of what's going on in here for raising plants to help with biocontrol, um, rearing of insects and things. And then he lets me have a little space so that I can rear a few specimens of weeds to give for educational events and tours like this. So I think um, not, not um, intentionally, if you see some of the, the cages and exclosures, there could be some plants in those generally. Anything that would be outside of a cage would be incidental and not intentional. And we have um, another older greenhouse next door that has a lot of cages in it as well, I think. Um, a lot of the most current biocontrol rearing is happening here on, on Japanese knotweed, which we'll talk about later, but that's why there's quite a few Japanese knotweed plants in here right now. Right. Yeah. And it's all Japanese knotweed? Uh, no, it's a mixture of Japanese and Bohemian and um, giant knotweed. Right. And Bohemian is that kind of cross hybridization in the wild of the two Japanese and giant. I think I've got a pretty good collection of plants now here. Maybe I'll bring over one more because I think people are going to know what this one is. <laughs> I know, yes. All right. So um, primarily today, I'm going to go over some of the main um, plants that at least I have specimens for that are issues in, in Western Oregon. And then also ones that are kind of ornamental in nature because those especially we want to make sure that if people are enjoying them at their house, that they aren't sharing them or spreading them or finding ways to keep them under control if they don't get rid of them completely. So um, since you mentioned Stinky Bob, I'm going to go ahead and take these off my head. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with this. The other name for Stinky Bob is Herb Robert. Um, this is a geranium that has um, another close relative called shiny geranium that's even more invasive. I just don't have any current specimens growing. I need to go harvest some more in the wild this year. But um, as an annual plant, it really puts all its energy into a ton of seed production. And it really has a pretty wimpy little root system. If you can see this, you can see that it's just this one tendril. And then there's just a few little fibrous roots here. It doesn't grow a huge, robust tap root or anything, um, but very uh, pungent smell. And, um, and a lot of vegetation. And this is a nice robust one. You might see lots of little seedlings carpeting around. You might see once they get enough moisture, they might get nice and big like this. And we don't see any uh, flowers starting on this, but there would be tiny pink flowers with five petals that then turn into a little capsule, a long capsule full of seeds. And that cycle, once it gets going, will go the entire growing season from now until October or so when it starts to frost and they start to die back. So they just have the ability to pump a lot of seed into the soil. Um, and they, they can kind of get going in early spring before a lot of the background native vegetation has emerged. So they get a little competitive advantage that way as well. So this is definitely one, if you start to see it pop up around your yard that you want to um, start pulling out those seedlings, you can use an, um, an herbicide to knock them back. But if you get ahead of them in the spring, you can prevent all that seeding from happening all season long. Once they do go to seed, you're gonna have a, a seed bank in the soil. So even if you get rid of all the plants you have, you're likely to have seeds still from previous seasons that might have to take a while to flush out. But if you stay on top of it for a few seasons, you should see a huge reduction if you've got a problem with this one or, the sh or shiny geranium. Um, shiny geranium doesn't have as lacy of leaves. It's got a little more round with waves around the edges. Um, and it also has the same looking flower, a little bit longer seed capsule, but just very similar in all the ways with the leaf shape. So I'll put this one aside.
Oh, okay, gotcha. Good to know. So uh, the next one I'm gonna introduce you to is probably one of the ones that I see being the most problem in the ornamental trade still. So anytime um, a weed gets added to our noxious weed list in the state of Oregon, that means it's a regulated plant. It's kind of different than just a weed, which is any plant growing where you don't want it. But a noxious weed is a regulated plant. That means um, that we can provide help in getting rid of it in, um, to, in the form of grant funds or depending on the priority of the weed, we might at ODA help directly with control in certain, in certain situations. Um, but once we add them to the noxious weed list, there's a separate process to add them to our quarantine list. And that usually happens within the same year as the noxious weed listing. Um, in the case of ornamental plants, sometimes it goes a little bit longer while we kind of get feedback from the nursery industry about the economic impacts of putting a plant on the quarantine list. Um, but this is one that's definitely been added. It's yellow archangel. And it has this very pretty variegated leaf to it. It's got some yellow flowers that'll appear in the spring and early summer, um, but not always. A lot of time it just stays in vegetative without flowering, but it really spreads when it gets introduced into a naturalized landscape, just all over the understory. And it can grow really well in shady forested areas. And we see a lot of probably yard waste dumps where people sometimes, we don't know if they're just intentionally illegally dumping or if they think that putting something out in a natural area is actually helping the environment instead of throwing it away. But uh, this one, once it gets introduced into a system like that, will take all over. It doesn't climb up trees like ivy, but it grows really fast in the understory, probably faster than ivy does. So this one, um, yellow archangel is um, Lamy Astrin Galeobdalon, I think is its scientific name. And that's actually what we check when we have nursery inspectors going to nurseries. Their primary job is looking for pathogens before nursery stock is sold, but they also have a secondary job of checking for um, regulated plants that aren't supposed to be sold. But personally, I've gone shopping almost every year and found yellow archangels still in nurseries. And one of the problems with that is there's a couple of older scientific names, a lamium or lamiastrum can both be the genus of this plant. And sometimes their filters, their plant buyers filters don't pick up this one. So if you ever do see this one in a nursery, it's a really good idea just to call the Oregon Department of Agriculture. You can look us up online and look for the plant program area um, contact and a nursery inspector can come by and kind of educate them about what's going on. And they'll usually take the plants that they're selling with them so they don't it um, out anymore. Um, if you do have this plant, if it's not going to spread beyond your property if you keep it trimmed back, uh, but if it is flowering, it's going to possibly go to seed and spread beyond your property out of your control. So I do recommend removing it completely or keeping it really trimmed back into one specific location where you can take all of the flowers off before they go to seed. If you're trimming it back, um, what should you do with the clippings? Good question. Um, I recommend putting the clippings in the garbage. You could put them um, in compost, um, but you're likely to see a little bit of re-sprouting if it's not a really hot compost. Um, I'm not sure how well this one, we call it lamination, when a, when a plant lays down in the soil, sometimes roots can grow from these nodes where the leaves are coming out. Um, I'm not sure how well this laminates. When I've treated it in the forest, I haven't seen a lot of rooting when I've pulled it. Um, but I, I would just be really careful. I, it's probably best just to put it in the garbage instead of the compost or in your yard waste bin. All right, let me set yellow aside. And that's right. Oh, I should have like saved the best for last there with the weed of the month. Um, let's get into a couple of ivies because these are interesting to contrast with one another. They both have the common name of ivy in them. I'm guessing many people are familiar with this one and hopefully you all know that this is a noxious weed. It's on our quarantine list and it's on our noxious weed list. And um, it actually, we've discovered there are two kind of, there are two distinct species of what we call English ivy. And now we've divided them into English ivy and Atlantic ivy. And Atlantic ivy is really the one that seems to be the most prevalent when you're seeing it really go crazy and wild and climb up trees. Um, it's probably the Atlantic ivy version and not the English ivy version. But because they are so similar, um, maybe the English 
Shivey sometimes has a much longer middle lobe. If you can see this lobe, it's kind of sticking out there. Um, the ones that are classically more English ivy will often have a longer lobe in the middle. Um, but the trouble is during different parts of their growth stage, they completely cross over in the way they appear. And so you can't just always look right at it to know. Uh, you would need somebody with a plant scope to look at the stomata at the bottom of the leaf under magnification. And if there are leaves around the tiny little breathing holes, then it's one. And if there aren't, not leaves, but uh, hairs, th then it's the other. But Functionally, it doesn't matter. The, the, they both cause damage and they are both uh, managed the same way. Um, so definitely, if you have a large English ivy infestation, I would get a hold of your local soil and water conservation district and chat with them, especially if you're a landowner with a significant amount that they might be able to help guide you with a management plan. Um, generally, we want to get ivy down from trees first and then start dealing with the understory vegetation. So this version of ivy is called, it's called a German ivy or Cape ivy. And it is not really related very closely to English ivy at all, um, but it grows faster and denser. And uh, this was a specimen that was confiscated at a nursery up in the Willamette Valley area actually. But the only naturalized infestations that we know of now are down on the south coast in the um, either Curry, I believe it's Curry County or Coos County, but Curry is the one I think. It's growing along some cliff sides next to the ocean there. Um, it actually is more closely related to this next door neighbor that we'll talk about in a second. This is Tansy Ragwort. Um, it actually at one time shared the same genus that tansy used to have as well. And it has yellow flowers that are similar to tansy, but it's an ivy that grows and, and grows up things and, and chokes things. So um, this is one that we have on our A list. English ivy was on our B list. And that's the way ODA prioritizes how important it is to contain and stop an individual type of noxious weed. Um, these are the ones that you probably don't know about because we're really trying to completely contain them because they, we know they have the potential to be everywhere like some of our B-listed weeds already are. So this is where a lot of energy of our own staff time goes and um, prioritizing grant projects that are dealing with a plant like this um, is really a high priority. And now we've got some uh, nursery inspectors that have a really good eye for it too. So we're hoping to get it completely out of the nursery trade if it's slipping by. Um, it's another one of those that because it's changed its genus name and it goes by a couple of common names, again, it's every once in a while, it's slipping by. It also grows so easily. I think one nursery was propagating all of the things they were selling from one hanging plant and all they had to do was clip and get started and they were able to propagate. So they weren't officially buying it and maybe that's why it also got by their, their knowledge that it was um, a regulated plant and they shouldn't have it. Go ahead and move the ivies. Any I don't other see questions, questions. Pop in? Okay. And feel free, Heath, if you know, like, like you did before, if you've got anything popping up. Okay, here I'm going to move to one that's not really um, a, um, an, an ornamental plant. This is tansy ragwort, and it's really the, the whole reason why our noxious weed program got started, because it was the first target uh, plant for a biological control agent. And if you've been around Oregon for a while, you probably remember, especially in the 70s and early 80s, just an explosion of the tansy ragwort, uh, what people call the tansy caterpillar, which is the larvae of the cinnabar moth. And it's a really striking yellow and black caterpillar. And once the tansy bolts and goes to flower, that's usually when those caterpillars are emerging and they really defoliate the plant. And uh, we had a time in Oregon where pretty much the whole Willamette Valley landscape in the middle of summer was just flowered with tansy ragwort. The problem with it wasn't as much an ecological disturbance as it was toxic to livestock. So um, it was usually disturbed over grazed ground that the tansy got a hold in. And now that we've introduced the biological control agents, it is still in the landscape, but at least it has a natural predator that keeps it under control. Um, after we did the cinnabar moth, we did another release of something called a flea beetle, a golden flea beetle. And it actually lays its eggs in the bottom of the plant. And in the fall, that uh, larvae hatches and starts to eat out the root 
before the plant ever even gets a chance to bolt and flower. So that's what's cut down the most on seed production and actually done the most to control tansy in Oregon is the little flea beetle that most people don't know about. Um, if you want to know it's there, I don't have any evidence of it on the plants I have in the greenhouse, but if you hold up a leaf and you see a lot of little shotgun holes, we call them just a lot of little holes throughout the plant, that's probably evidence that the larva has been feeding um, on the leaves. So should you try and move the biocontrol if you see the, that evidence? Should you try and move it to like another patch? They're going to move themselves. Yeah, they um, they get around really well. I don't think we have many places in the Willamette Valley at all that don't show evidence of these plants. But if you're looking, if you seem to have a pretty robust tansy patch and you haven't seen cinnabar moth larva on them in maybe three or four years and you're not seeing evidence of shotgun holes, then that might be a candidate. Um, we don't actively collect and move around insects anymore. But if we know of a particular area that seems to have lost their agents, we might be able to, to help get a few more moved in. But generally that's why they're such, it's so good to have biocontrol because they move themselves pretty well. Some of them slower than others, but the flea beetles seem, seem to get around pretty well. All right. All right, I'm gonna move on to this one. This one is not uh, hugely prevalent, but it does have a pretty showy little flower. It's one of the two uh, toad flax plants that we have. It's very much like a snapdragon. This one is yellow toad flax or also called butter and eggs for its difference in the bright orange kind of yolky color and the buttery outside uh, petal color. Um, this one has very linear thin leaves and it's probably not one that you would ever come across in the nursery trade by accident. It's been out there for a while, but it is possible because of its showiness that if someone had it appear, they might think, oh, that's pretty. I think I'll let that grow and let it go to seed and spread it around a little bit more. And, and then it could really start a problem, especially if you live anywhere near the um, forest, other natural areas. So um, it's the, you, pretty petite little, it's much smaller flower than your standard snapdragon that you'd grow intentionally. Um, and it's not really that closely related to a snapdragon, but just has that similar look to it. So butter and eggs, yellow toad flax. So why is that a bad plant? Like what, it, is, what are the impacts? It, it just has an impact because it, um, it spreads so well and just doesn't have any natural enemies. We don't have a biological control agent for yellow toad flax. Um, and a really active one. I know Dalmatian toad flax, our other toad flax, there is a good biological control agent out there. And there might be some research going on on this one as well, which I think this was one of Joel's specimens too. So I think he may have, um, there may be some research going on into it, but we don't have anything active, but it's really just one of those, um, it, it outcompetes everything because it doesn't have natural enemies. And that's, that's how a lot of our noxious weeds are why they're problems. It's just because they're, they don't have any restraints on them and they're able to outcompete native vegetation. And that's what this one falls into. Where and is this existing? Are there existing populations of it around? There, there, the ones that I know of are small patches. There have been some in Willamette National Forest. I don't know of any specifically down in Willamette Valley or not, but um, I think all known patches of this are under control right now. But be, when we look at ornamental things, we always are wary because you just never know if they just might be in someone's backyard, that's not gonna come to our attention as easily as when they're on a public land where we have land managers who are actively surveying and have eyes out on the ground. So when we think something might be in someone's backyard, we really rely on people if they think they have it to take a picture and let us know. And then we can let you know, yeah, that's, the, that's what we're looking for. Let's get rid of it. Or nope, you're fine. Enjoy your plant and continue on. All right, here's a, a fan favorite. <laughs> this is butterfly bush, a very pared down one. Every once in a while, I'm lucky and I get this puppy to give me a flower too. Um, it's funny when you're trying to grow noxious weeds on purpose, it can <laughs> be a challenge to get them to do what they do in the wild. It's actually hardly any of my plants here grow like they grow in the wild. So it's while it's nice to have a live one in front of you, I'm never quite getting people the same show as I could give them if I were doing a field tour or something. Um, butterfly bush is a lot of people wonder why it's a noxious weed because they don't see it naturalizing on their property where they have a nice big bush of it. And it's an interesting one that it seems to be the soil type that really triggers whether it's going to go crazy and become 
invasive. Unfortunately, the kind of soil it likes is a sandy, gravelly soil, which is what most of our river bottoms and river banks and islands in rivers are made of. So, um, and uh, sandy forest soils on the coast are all really susceptible to naturalizing butterfly bush. Yes, along railroad tracks. Yep, because they've got any place where they've laid gravel down and it's pretty well drained. Um, then they seem the seeds seem to germinate really well. When you have really heavy clay soils, you won't see them germinate as much. Um, the trick is that the seed that you have maybe growing from a butterfly bush you have in your yard that hasn't had the seed head clipped, that might spread around either on someone's foot walking around the garden, or it might be insects or birds just moving it. So um, if you do have a lovely butterfly bush, um, I don't... I'm not asking you to cut your beautiful landscape butterfly bush down at this point, but manage it. Keep it trimmed so that it, you can trim off the blooms as soon as they start to die back, and then you won't have any seed source. This isn't going to spread by roots underground. It's not going to run around and grow in that way. It's really the seed. So if you keep a butterfly bush trimmed, then you're going to be in good shape. I'd also recommend looking, um, nurseries are allowed to sell certain very specific varieties of butterfly bush that have been genetically tested for sterility. And they are very specific named varieties that you can find on the nursery program's website for ODA. I think there's about four or five very specific ones. If you see something that's just called butterfly bush and it doesn't have a specific variety, you're probably looking at a, a plant that's for sale illegally. Um, I have seen little pop-up plant booths at fairs and festivals or, you know, garden swaps, things like that, where people have had butterfly bush out. And I've let them know that that's really not okay. And, and because they couldn't show me that they were these specific varieties. So again, don't share your butterfly bush if you have it. If you do have one and you want to keep it, keep the, the blooms trimmed back as soon as you're done enjoying the color and they start to shrivel up a little bit. That's the time to get rid of the bloom. Don't let any seed form. Oh, I already did one of those. Okay, here's another one. Unfortunately, again, we're a little bit early in the season to get some of my plants blooming, but this one is called perennial pea vine. This foliage is probably gonna look pretty similar to some other sweet peas and other ornamental pea varieties. Most of those pea varieties are not perennials, they're annuals. So this particular one is a perennial. So if you have a pea vine that seems to have just found its way to your yard, it's got beautiful showy pink flowers that I wish I could show you. It looks like we've got some, maybe some formation at the very beginnings of some buds, but um, it, it will come back year after year, year from this uh, root stock and just grow more and more. And I've really seen this starting to take over in open areas of the forest that are adjacent to more um, habitated disturbed areas. Um, but the birds, especially waterfowl, really love the seed. And so it's easy to get this one spread around by um, birds eating it and eating the seed and then, you know, flying over and dropping them into other places. If it's a sunny open area, it's just going to start to over top all the other vegetation, even other noxious weeds <laughs> that are growing there. Um, really bright pink flowers with a little bit of white, maybe going into a little purple, but mostly it's a bright fuchsia to then lighter pink combination of colors on perennial pea vine. Um, sometimes this is one when we're after a particular um, main weed, we'll see this one kind of start coming in as a secondary weed just because there's more and more source of it. And we end up having to come back to deal with pea vine. Um, it really, it responds well to herbicide. I think it would be a very hard one to dig out and, and do manual control unless you just have, a, you know, a kind of a normal residential urban sized yard and you have some growing in it. You could definitely control that either manually or with herbicide. Um, but if you have a larger uh, property with a lot of it going, it would probably need an herbicide treatment to get it under control or a nice army of people who can um, start trimming the vegetation back and then digging the roots out. So this is pretty widespread? It is really widespread, unfortunately. It's on our B list. Um, we haven't, we, we don't go after it particularly unless we're working on a national forest property where they've identified a particularly troublesome area. 
um, if we come across it working on other priority plants and it's within our ability to, to control it as well, we do because we, we do want to not let it spread around as fast as it can. Um, but there is quite a bit of this in the Willamette Valley already, unfortunately. So it's an important one, though. It's really showy and it would be really easy to see why people would want to take this and even dig it up if they find it in the wild. People often assume that because something's growing in the wild, it's a native plant. And that's really not the case. Unfortunately, we have a lot of beautiful, noxious weeds out there. Um, so knowing your plants, knowing how to identify before you move something. Um, also, if you're on public land, it's not been not legal just to dig things up and, and move them out of there as well. But um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to have to look it up because my mind's going blank. Some of them, I think of their scientific name first, and I have to uh, dig up their common name, but uh, perennial pea vine. Uh, oh, I've got somebody on the call. No. Oh, yes. But Probably it's, it, it could be Lathrum. Yeah, I think it's Lathrum. Laddie. Yeah, I think that. Okay, let's get another one. This one is definitely can grow in Northwest Oregon. It's not very common. Um, it is a bee weed, but we also give it what we call a T designation, which it's still a target because it still has a lot of range that it hasn't invaded. And this is gorse. Interesting, when it's growing, it almost kind of has a rosemary look to it, how rosemaries can get kind of rangy and viney almost. They don't climb things, but they that the uh, big gorse bush will look very similar to that. This is very sharp and... Uh, even just a little bit of pressure is kind of painful on my hand from the, the, the sharp tips of it. Um, and it is our the biggest problem on the south coast of Oregon. It, um, it was brought over from someone who um, immigrated to Oregon from Scotland, where it's a native plant. And I think it's called furs over there. Like the wren and the furs is about gorse, the song, the wren and the furs, which is a Christmas carol. Um, and it's got a beautiful pea um, pea type flower that grows in blooms in about this time. It can start blooming February, March. Um, and it really takes over. I'm not sure if it actually is allelopathic, which means it exudes chemicals into the soil that, that exclude other plants. Um, but it has, it's a very, um, fertile, creates a lot of seed and creates dense, dense thickets of this really prickly plant that's really hard to get through. Um, the other huge problem with it are the, that exudes oils from the leaves that are really volatile. So even like in the middle of summer, you could probably light a little lighter up here and just see some little sparks light off because it has these oils that are coming off of it. And so you may have heard of uh, the town of Bandon burning a couple of times down on the Southwest coast. Um, they don't necessarily think that the fire was caused by gorse, but gorse definitely acted as an accelerant and played a part in probably the intensity of those fires down there because it's, uh, there's just acres and acres of solid gorse landscape. We have seen it established on the Northwest coast too, up in the, um, Fort Stevens area. And we have some small populations of it up near Estacada. So we know its range up here is still pretty good. Um, and once it, it gets started a little more slowly than maybe some other ones, because it's a full on woody shrub, it doesn't kind of grow as fast. But once it gets established and starts uh, spitting the seeds out, they have really long lived seed. So once they're in the seed bank, um, it's going to be a long time before you can really exhaust all of that potential plant growth out of the soil. So if you happen to see a really prickly plant that looks kind of like scotch broom, but is really prickly prickly and sharp. That's where you, you really want to know where you found it if you're in the Willamette Valley area, especially. Um, I think Estacada is probably the closest known uh, gorse population, but it's a good one to keep your eye out for. All right, I've got just a couple of other babies here. Here is another one. I really wish I could have forced this one to send up a flower because it's quite showy and distinct. And when it's just in uh, leaf here, it's it's pretty much indistinct. It has a, a green leaf with some hairs on it. It doesn't have any kind of lobing or cuts in the edges of the leaf, what we call entire. Uh, but this is one of our important hawkweed species. This is orange hawkweed. And it actually bolts up with a um, 
a stem that doesn't have any leaves on it. And then it gets a flower head of buds that are really dark black with lots of little black hairs on them. The black hairs cause the whole thing to look black. And then it starts to open in a really showy orange flower from each of those buds. And uh, it's, it has been in the ornamental trade in the past, but probably not for 20 years or so um, legally, but it was sold. And so we know there's probably a number of people who may still have this in their backyard. If they do, they are probably battling it every year <laughs> to try to keep it back because it has very fertile seed. It, um, it has a great um, germination rate on the seed. And then it also spreads by these stolons um, underground and uh, above ground both. The, the stolons are the above ground growth off of the side of the plant. So like a strawberry plant, it sends out all these little daughters plants that just root and each one of these little nodes can start another plant and it just grows great in a big mat. And also all of the seeds from the flowers are also flying and causing more spread further around, which becomes its own little clonal colony. Um, this is a really important plant to stop because it really can threaten our um, wilderness meadows. And we have a project up on Mount Hood in the Welch's area, up above Welch's, there's the Lolo Pass Road with a power line going through it. That's one of our most important um, areas of containment and control. But we have many other locations, um, individual small locations where we found it, where people grew it intentionally. Either they found it and shared it, or they found it at a nursery before we um, put it on our nox noxious weed list and regulated it. So. Um, one of the keys about this is just this really hairiness of the leaf. And if you see daughter plants, little plants budding off of the main plant and spreading out, um, that's another big key. And if you see it, this flower with any bright orange flowers on a stem that has no leaves, it's pretty naked. Sometimes it'll pop out a tiny little leaf, maybe a little more than a quarter inch long, but other than that, it's leafless, then that's a really good clue that you've got this. And we need to know that right away so that we can come help you. It, this is an A-listed weed, as I mentioned, it's one of our top priorities. So anytime we know or find A-listed weeds, our team will come and help you control it for no cost, um, or we'll arrange another local cooperator and provide them funding through a grant to help control it as well. So um, the other version of this we call meadow hawkweed. We have listed that now as a B plant with that T, the target designation. It still is very rare in the Willamette Valley though. We kind of treat it here like it's an A weed, but we have in Northeastern Oregon, very large population of it that kind of caused it to be downgraded because it was beyond the ability to completely um, contain it. And now we're working on suppression as much as we can there. Um, but here we would still treat the yellow version. It, it almost looks exactly the same. Uh, the leaf looks very similar. It grows with these stolons. It has a long leafless stalk, but it has yellow flowers instead of bright orange ones on the bud. All right. Oh, I did see, I forgot I still have one over here that I want to talk about because this is definitely a huge threat in the Willamette Valley. It's a grass um, and it's called false brome. Um, you're going to see this one. Um, it's tough for a non-professional to just know they're coming across this out in the forest. But some of the keys of it are actually showing pretty well in this. And this is this limey green color. In fact, it's funny. Heath has a lime green <laughs> case around her phone mm -hmm. that I'm seeing. It's like it's a little brighter than this, but it's kind of getting there. Um, it's a hairy leaf, not really any um, red at the bottom of the stem like some of the native true bromes have, but our true bromes also don't have the hairy edges and hairy leaf. And it's the hairs that cause it to also shine a little bit. And you can see some of these leaves as they're starting to emerge now for the season are starting to flop over. That's very indicative of false brome. It comes up almost like a fountain on all sides and flops over and it looks shiny and lime green. If it's in the bright sun, it's a brighter lime green, more chartreuse lime green. And if it's um, in the forest, it's a deeper, almost like a true lime rind, you know, the, the rind of a lime plant, um, darker green, maybe one, maybe one more like this, if we can compare a couple of these side by side, there we go. You can see the difference in color. This is more like what happens in the sun and this is more like what happens in the shade but they both still take on a shine. So this is one um, 
you may be in an area that already is very well infested with this, or you may be in an area where it's only just starting. So feel free to let us know if you've got this and we'll kind of let you know, yeah, sorry, you're kind of in one of those ground zero areas or, oh, that's a new infestation. Let's stop that before it does become a big problem in your area. Are there places where you're hoping to keep it from that we should know about? Um, I, I can tell you where I know it to be. Yeah. Um, we do have quite a bit of it in the Santa Am Canyon. Um, there is quite a bit growing in the Corvallis. Corvallis is actually the, where it really started. It was part of a process of uh, revegetating, uh, testing about revegetation after cutting and in, in forestry that kind of went wrong. <laughs> and so a lot of the stuff that spread is spread from there. So that there's going to be a lot of it there. Um, if you find it on in coastal forests, that's really important because it has moved from those uh, coast range mountains of the west side of the coast range. It's starting, I mean, in the east side of the coast range, starting to move over into coastal forests, and it, but it's less prevalent there. Um, up on Mount Hood, we don't have much of it at all. So if you're anywhere in the Mount Hood area, that was good. That, that's good, and it would be good to know. Um, there is a lot of it in the Clackamas drainage and the lower down Clackamas drainage as well. Um, but in the upper forest, we have just few known populations that we're treating for complete eradication in the upper parts of the Clackamas. And that's probably true of the upper Sandy Yam also. Um, I actually help with Willamette National Forest on the Detroit Ranger District. The biggest population there is along Blowout Road around Detroit Lake on the backside of the lake from where the highway comes by. Um, but if you find it anywhere else besides there in the forest, that would be a, the, a time we needed to stop it. But once we get down into kind of a uh, Mill City, Fisherman's Bend area of Santa Am Canyon, that's where it's a lot more prevalent. So, um, but really feel free to let us know where you've seen it anywhere. And we can just let you know if it's a known population or not, and we can hopefully get it on our radar. Um, look, the main look like for this would be the uh, Columbia brome, which is a native brome. This one is not a true brome. It's called false brome because it's not really a brome, but it has a similar look. Um, the native brome would have no hairs on it, and it would have uh, red stems all around the bottom. So again, a tough one. That's why if you think you might have it, just snap a picture. Make sure in any pictures that you want to take and send um, that you just get a good a uh, good close-up that's in focus of leaves, flowers, and then one of the whole plant, because the way we identify from pictures is to compare the detail of leaves and flowers with the whole form of what the plant looks like and how it's growing. So um, this would be a great one to take a picture if you suspect it. And it doesn't provide good forage. It doesn't, yeah. Unfortunately, it has a lot of silica content in it. So um, it's avoided by deer and other browsers who would normally be um, deer and elk that would normally be grazing it, uh, they pass it up, which just gives it an extra advantage because all of the actual uh, beneficial plants are being eaten down more, which gives this more space to move into. And it, silica is really like glass basically. So it's uh, not really palatable. All right, so the last one I've got here, maybe familiar to some people also, um, this is Japanese knotweed. And these, um, as if Heath was showing you around, I've got more of them behind me. These are really tiny plants compared to what we would find in the wild. These grow up into very large stands with very fleecy um, flower heads that, that attract a lot of bees, actually, um, honeybees specifically, mostly. Um, but they really are a problem, especially when they get into riparian areas along stream banks and river banks. Um, any part of this plant that's broken off can reroute and cause a new plant. So if you just decide you're going to cut this down and toss all of the material on the ground, letting it decompose, you're probably going to start a new uh, stand of it right where you dumped all of that material. Also, all of the root fragments. Um, oh, look at the roots. Yeah, I know. They're starting, these, these are starting to emerge. More canes are going to start emerging from these little buds. But those roots um, also can break off and break apart and any little piece of the root can start a new uh, colony yes, also. Um, yep, even as well, these are kind of dried out. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the problem that happens is that this doesn't actually provide a lot of bank stabilization. 
And so if uh, you get a lot of erosion happening on a stream bank that has this, those root fragments are going to be in that eroded material and they're going to float right on down and keep colonizing right down the river. So when you've had an unaddressed um, patch of knotweed in an upper watershed, eventually you could just colonize the entire stream bank. When it grows, it actually has this, this gets even thicker and rounder, I'd say probably an inch diameter around once they get nice and mature and they're really hollow. Um, and so they kind of look like bamboo and, and the, the cane part of it. Yeah, they are edible. They're not a poisonous. Yeah. And can you, you know, one of the things that's fascinating to me with this plant is that the, when the, the leaves fall off, the nutrients from those leaves get sucked back into the plant beforehand. So it's not, can you talk about that? A little? I, I actually don't have as much knowledge about its nutrient cycling. Okay. So that's, that's interesting so for me too. For macro invertebrates right. and stuff that will be eating it in the stream. So it's really yes. bad for the whole system. Yeah. It's, um, it's definitely one of the biggest threats to in, uh, water quality in riparian areas is having this completely take over because if it's not going to support the whole ecosystem of the stream, um, and it's not going to allow other beneficial, more uh, fibrous rooted plants to be in there. Um, it's really a huge detriment to the system. Um, this is one, unfortunately, that manual control is really not recommended unless you happen to have one very isolated patch as an ornamental. You could potentially dig out the whole thing. Then you'd have to watch to see because what can happen is let's say you have a plant growing up out of the center of my hand and all these roots coming and you decide to dig it out and you dig right here. Well, you've just started one, two, three, four, five more new plants all around the perimeter if you didn't actually dig out to the very, very, very tips of the roots. So um, you would have small plants growing up next year that you'd need to dig out and you could probably manage that. But if you imagine that across a landscape of a large infestation, that's really not possible and probably could cause the the infestation to get worse. And the depth of the yeah, the depth of the roots too. You really need to get every bit all the way to the bottom. So we really recommend the primary main control of this to be an herbicide application, um, a foliar application of something like um, glyphosate Roundup works well. Um, a Mazapir is another one. You, it really needs to be a specific prescription from a professional who knows the area that you're in. Um, but you, the, the key to it is uh, covering the whole plant, all the stems, the bottoms of the leaves, the tops of the leaves, because it has a very hardy root system. You need to be able to translocate the herbicide, the plant, you're going to use the plant's mechanism to bring the herbicide down into the roots. So you need every bit of surface possible to get enough herbicide into the root system. And you want to wait until after it's done flowering to do that, which is late July um, into August. Yeah, we do have one question. Yeah. Uh, so first, birch laurel is on what list? It's on both the noxious weed list and on the um, quarantine list. So it is, um, spurge laurel is similar to like the ornamental uh, Daphne odora, the, the nice pink flowered one. It uh, has a similar look to the flower shape, but a different color. Um, it's not, it doesn't have a beautiful smell to it, but it's got kind of an evergreen, shiny, waxy leaf that will stay around. But it is definitely on the noxious weed list and um, on the quarantine list. So hopefully folks can get rid of that. Um, it spreads primarily by seed and um, birds moving the seed around. Okay, and I do have a hand raised, so I'm going to put my molly. Okay. Helen, Helen uh, it looks, looks like, like you, you have, have a question. question. Oh, oh, you're, you're muted. muted. Sorry, I uh, I just wanted to know, maybe unrelated, but I just wanted to know how toxic is glyco-safe or Roundup or Cornerstone for um, bees? Uh, we don't know of any toxicity to bees directly from the herbicides that I've mentioned. Um, when pesticides are formulated, they're generally formulated very specifically to pathways within the organism and bees and plants are so far apart from each other that the pathways that that is targeting in the plant is not uh, a target. That's not a pathway that is going to be uh, toxic to bees. One thing that's important about bees though is that in order to um, get a successful treatment, 
on a, an herbicide treatment, you often need to add a surfactant, which helps the herbicide coat the plant better. That can be an issue to bees. Um, it, can, it can coat the hairs on the bees and make them less able to function. So we are really cognizant of the fact that when we're using herbicides, if it's on a plant, that's why I recommend that you wait until after flowers to nest from a Japanese knotweed plant so that you're not spraying it over um, honeybees. And um, generally honeybees are the main, um, the main issue here. They're not native bees. They're kind of like people's livestock, but we still don't want to yeah. harm them either. Um, right. But other bees that have hairs on them, if they are using the flowers, they will not be hurt if the plant has an herbicide application and then a bee comes later. It's really that act of actively spraying over so if I come to a plant that seems to be using, I kind of do a whack the plant method first, where I disturb the bees to fly off the plant before I treat the plants. Beth, you okay. might want to talk a little bit about IPN and the philosophy of like having things in your toolbox and what you use. You again. betcha. Yeah, well, one of the tools that we have here is one of our best non-pesticide things. And that's what's happening with our... Uh... I, a herbicide, you're going to have to put a lot of herbicide out, which isn't our goal at all. Our goal is really to find all the smallest infestations and address them quickly before we need large amounts of herbicide. If we can address natural predators that have been safely tested and they get tested kind of at the international, national level before they're allowed out, then we have a tool in our toolbox that gives a lot of uh, suppression to a large amount of noxious weeds without any herbicides at all. If you have the opportunity, and I, I live in a small residential lot and I don't actually use herbicides on my property at all because I can manually handle everything that comes up on my property. So if it's something I can dig out um, first or pull out, then I do that first. Now, when I'm working on a landscape level with a plant that's damaging the whole ecosystem, the, then I, I may decide that the herbicide is the best tool in my toolbox to actually protect the environment from the encroachment of these plants and the reducing of biodiversity in the area, weighing that choice to use an herbicide. And then again, um, basically not trying to harass any wildlife and <laughs> other stuff that's around and trying to be as targeted as, as I can to the exact plant that I'm I'm going after. And so anytime I can find an herbicide that is a lot more specific to an individual plant, um, this one, I mean, you pull back uh, this orange hawkweed, for example, there is an herbicide I can use on this. It's very specific to aster family plants. And actually, um, it, it, there are other things that it will also impact, but not as many. So I can target down and use an herbicide that's very more specific and protect a lot of other plant material around as well. Um, if you're using herbicides, you'll notice that there is some kind of a warning label on the herbicide. There will be warning labels for human health. Um, it might say, it might not have any, any warning. It might, it might have a caution, warning, danger. That's the kind of indicative of how toxic they are to humans in their concentrated form. But there will also be the environmental um, part of the label. And that's really important if you decide that you need to use an herbicide to pay attention to the environmental impacts because there will be the ways to mitigate those impacts or stop those impacts as well on the label. But uh, we have manual control, mechanical control, bio control. Those are all the things that we prefer before we go to the herbicide. And then can, do you want to talk about culture a little? So for example, yeah, uh, yeah. one of our presenters is going to talk about solarization. Yes. Um, yeah, you can manage landscapes in other ways as well. Um, and a big example of cultural control would be the use of fire on a landscape to, um, to knock back certain types of vegetation to allow a, a kind of flushing. So uh, Native Americans would burn landscapes to encourage camas growth in meadows, for example. So that's an example of a cultural control. Um, mulching, solarization, things that where you're affecting the ability um, of the way the landscape responds on a larger scale are also parts of that um, toolbox as well. We did have another question. Uh, can you do cut stump with herbicide? You can, it depends on the what, what you're doing. If it's a woody material though, you can do cut stump, which is very targeted to that individual plant. 
The key with cut stump is that it's really only the outer edge of the plant that's live and moving material. So you don't actually have to paint a whole stump. You only have to paint around the outer edges. And you often can do that with just the concentrated herbicide formulation with a paintbrush or a little sponge. Um, of course, using all the right gear that's listed on the label, gloves, long sleeves, all of that still applies. But yeah, we do, um, we have done in some sensitive habitats with endangered plants where we've got scotch broom growing, we've done some cut stump treatments to be more targeted there. Um, it is important to know exactly if you're using a cut stump versus leaving the plant growing and, and cutting little cuts around the stump and, and putting herbicide into those little cuts while the plant is whole, that can be more um, reliable on plants that grow a lot of shoots from their roots. Because when you do cut stump, you might encourage a lot of growth up from the roots when you do that whole one, it actually gets the herbicide into the root system better. So again, talk to a professional. You can, you can check with your soil water conservation district. If it's a, a, a noxious weed, especially, we're welcome to check in with ODA and see what the best control method. The one that pops to my mind of not being the best for stump is tree of heaven, which um, is important to, to know because that one is becoming more and more of an issue with the cohabitation of the spotted lantern fly, which is an invasive insect that we haven't found in Oregon yet, but loves tree of heaven. So uh, we're trying to get on top of more tree of heaven uh, survey and control now to prevent more um, introduction or possible habitat for spotted lantern fly. So that's one of those that a cut step treatment might actually cause a huge amount of sprouting around the outside of the tree if you don't actually deal with it in, in more of with a cut and frill version of herbicide treatment. No other questions in the chat. So it, it is about time for us to wrap up. I just wanted to do another a uh, uh, quick, quick ask, ask to see if there were any further questions before we conclude. Um, well, I'm just happy that you got to come visit me in the greenhouse. Um, this uh, greenhouse collection has been grown to be able to travel around and take to meetings and organizations that are doing plant trainings. Um, and then we kind of got shut down by the pandemic. So I decided to open the greenhouse to just me and my selfie stick. And I did a few um, of these kind of five minute introductions to many of the plants when they actually had flowers on them. So if you want to go to ODA Noxious Weed Program's Facebook page, you can find a lot more videos of me chatting if you're, if you're not bored of hearing my voice and introducing you to one of these at a time. So, and many of those will actually have some more of the characteristics um, of the plant that are easier to identify. So I encourage you to go there um, and keep up. There are a lot of great citizen science efforts out there to collect information about where plants are and keep an eye out for a big announcement about a tree of heaven effort coming in May. Um, the third week of May is going to be Invasive Weed Awareness Week in Oregon. So um, keep following our ODA Facebook page to learn more about that. And we'll be at the Salem Saturday Market on May 21st. Yes. Invasive plants. Yes. You yes. Some of these from the collection will be there for sure. Yep. Okay. Well, okay, thank, thank you, you all, all for, for joining, joining us again today. Uh, we, we are going to be moving on to our next round of First Fridays will be in May. And I believe that's going to be starting at the noon hour instead of 10 a.m. So um, you'll be seeing some publications, some publicity about those events uh, coming up soon. And we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you at our First Friday events in the future. Thanks again for joining us today. <laughs>